Hello, everybody. Welcome to Safe and Decent PPE for Women Health and Care Workers. The reason for us being here is right there in the title. Seems obvious, seems important, it's necessary and critical. But as you will find out in a report that was published in November, which was a joint report from Women in Global Health and Johnson and Johnson, when more than a thousand women who were working in health or their care systems around 50 countries were asked what they needed in terms of PPE. They gave very direct responses. If you work in health or medicine or the care business, you are so used to coming up with solutions for challenges. And that is the aim of this next one hour. Thank you for being part of it. My name is Femi Oke. I'm your moderator for the next one hour. And health leaders, policy makers in the world of health, lend me your ears, lend us your ears. We are going to be talking to you directly about the issues with gender inequity and PPE. And we would like you to lean in and then we can work on that challenge together. There is a Q&A box. It is open, it is there for you to use. I'm sure you have questions and comments as well. Put them right there to be part of the conversation. And then also there will be Q&A really basically wrapped all the way through the conversation. So I'm looking forward to uh, having that conversation with you and the panelists. There will be presentations, there'll be an opening keynote. There's a lot going on in this next one hour. I will also, during the conversation, give you some of the key hashtags. So what we hear in this webinar, you can take and spread it around the world. Let's start with hashtag fit for women. We'll start with that one. And then we're really welcome. The person who's gonna get us kicking, kicked off for the first part of our conversation, really set the scene and help us understand this idea of inequity and gender in the world and then how it connects to the issue that we have with PPE and women. Our opening remarks, Carolyn Criado Perez, author and campaigner and advocate. Thank you so much for being part of today's discussion. Over to you. Um, hi, Femi, and um, hello, everyone. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, thank you in particular to Women in Global Health for producing this crucial report that I sincerely hope will achieve the change that is so very needed when it comes to female healthcare workers and their personal protective equipment. So my name is Caroline Criado Perez. I am the author of a book called Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. Um, this book looks at the causes and the consequences of the gender data gap. That is the fact that the vast majority of data we've collected globally and that we continue to collect, um, everything from medical data to economic data uh, to um, car safety data has been collected almost exclusively in men. And, um, to, to explain a little bit about that, today I'd like to talk to you about a good friend of mine uh, who I like to call Reference Man and why I think it's time that we retire him. So first of all, who is Reference Man? Well, Reference Man is Caucasian. He's 25 to 35 years old. He's 180 centimeters tall and he weighs 70 kilograms. Most importantly, Reference Man is a man. He is also the world's worst superhero. And like all good or bad superheroes, he has a superpower. And Reference Man's superpower is that he can represent everyone in the whole world. The trouble is Reference Man's superpower is a con. He cannot and he does not represent everyone. But of course that hasn't stopped us from using him as the basis on which we design pretty much the whole world. So I mentioned calf safety, let's just talk very briefly about that. For decades, the only dummy that was used in car crash safety tests is a dummy that represents the body of the average American male, that is, reference man, and it is still the most commonly used car crash test dummy. There is what is called a female car crash test dummy that was introduced to, for example, Euro NCAP tests in 2015, but this dummy is really just a heavily scaled down version of reference man, and it turns out women are not just small men. There are other differences, including things like breast tissue, muscle mass distribution, pelvic and spinal differences. None of these are accounted for in this small reference man, which in any case is only used in one out of the five regulatory tests and only in the passenger seat. And the result of designing car safety almost exclusively around protecting reference man is that cars are much less safe for women. And in fact, if a woman is in a car crash, she is 71% more likely to be injured than a man in the same crash. And she's 17% more likely to die. 
But car safety is not the only area in which our efforts to protect reference men leave women in danger. So we're here to talk about PPE, personal protective equipment. The clue is in the name. This is equipment that is meant to protect the wearer. But thanks to reference men, this protective equipment protects some workers much more than others. Reference man is why we have unisex, unisex in quote marks, stab vests that are designed for bodies without breasts, as if that is the neutral body rather than simply the body of 50% of people. Reference man is why we design women's safety shoes using a male last, even though female feet are not just small male feet. And I'm not going to get into the whole foot thing here, but I'm very cross about the foot thing because it affects me a lot personally. Uh, as a runner. And Reference Man is why we have a 70% female global health workforce having to make do with medical PPE that has been designed to fit, in the words of one female healthcare worker who uh, messaged me on Twitter, a six foot three inch bloke built like a rugby player. Since the beginning of the pandemic, I have been inundated with messages from female healthcare workers telling me that their PPE is too big for them. Their gowns and scrubs are a trip hazard. Their gloves get in the way of them doing complicated medical procedures like intubations and their masks do not seal to their faces. Um, I actually looked into the European standard, well I looked into several standards, but the European standard is the one I want to quickly talk to you about on respiratory protective devices and I got a clue into what the problem with the masks in particular might be. So section 8.3.1 called simulated wearing treatment specifies that the mask I'm quoting here, should be mounted on a Sheffield dummy head. What is a Sheffield dummy head? Well, it is literally a male head um, from Sheffield. It is the mold of the face of a large white man in his mid forties who just happened to work in the Sheffield Health and Safety Office back in 1988, and it has been used ever since. Meanwhile, section 8.5.1, the total inward leaking tests, you know, the test showing whether the virus particles are going to be able to get into the mask, um, calls for the mask to be fitted to 10 clean shaven persons, which I think speaks for itself. So these are just two examples. And um, there are so many more ways in which the world isn't designed for women from medical treatment to public spaces to the economy. But they all have one thing in common, reference man, who has put in decades of subpar work. He is the world's worst superhero, and I hope that today makes a step towards relegating him to the superhero scrap heap. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. And we would love to spend more time with you because we're just thinking about all the other parts of our design life as women that is not designed for us. And this is where we're hoping to change the script here regarding PPE. If you just joined, you're very welcome. Q&A box is there for you to ask questions. Put your comments in there. Greet each other in the comments section as well. Nice to see you. Welcome everybody from around the world. Let me give you some hashtags so that you can share this conversation beyond this webinar room. Women in GH. Hashtag women in GH. Hashtag PPE, of course. Hashtag fit for women. One more for you, hashtag gender equal HCW. Now you're ready to share what you hear here around the world and online. I want to bring in Rachel Thompson. I mentioned earlier that survey of almost a thousand female workers, health workers, care workers, talking about their experience of PPE during the pandemic, and then the report that came out of that. Rachel Thompson was intimately involved in that report, and here she is to tell us more. Rachel, over to you. Thank you, Femi. I'm just going to very quickly get my slides up and running. Um, I'm going to move to the beginning. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Femi. Thank you, Caroline, for being here um, and joining this discussion. Quickly skipping over some background of how this all started um, for women in global health anyway. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were hearing lots of reports um, around this issue of PPE, um, like Caroline also mentions that she had been sent um, really distressing stories, and in particular the story of um, UNFPA sending adult diapers to women nurses in Wuhan um, really caught the attention of, of the media and really highlighted that actually PPE for women health workers is a big problem. It's a long-standing problem, but like many things, COVID has shone a spotlight it and 
and on it and is really mobilizing us to do something about it. So Women in Global Health, um, myself and others, we conducted some research last year. We uh, launched a large online survey, like Femi mentioned, uh, reaching a large number of women health workers. And that's why we're here today to bring some of those voices into this dialogue around the executive board. I'm just going to run through some of the headlines and I should flag as well, there's um, a report, of course, downloadable online and also an executive summary you can skim through while I'm talking as well. Um, so yeah, fit, PP is not fit for women and we've got quotes here that really attest to that. Designed for men is failing women health workers and I should just clarify here as well, women are the majority of health workers, 70% and up to 90% of nurses, and they have been the majority on the front lines of COVID. They have been the ones needing PPE most. Um, but PPE is also not designed for the diversity among women health workers. So we've got these quotes here on whether that's because you're the wrong shape for it, the wrong shape, you're not reference man, or you've got a headdress, for example. It's not, it's not suitable and it's not working. And we heard so much, especially on the issue of periods, pregnancy and menopause. Um, so yeah, some really distressing, really distressing stories, people dreading going, women dreading going to work and even disrupting their menstrual cycles by using contraception that they didn't want to use and jeopardizing their reproductive health and able to to just to, and to be able to do their jobs what this all is linked to is of course gender inequity in the health system and this is and PPE is just one of the many issues that women in global health is talking about um, around the executive board but what we've seen is that women have been deprioritized for PPE um, and even when that it may have been available they didn't have access because of some of the gender dynamics to play and this really links to the issue of women's leadership um, and the fact that we need more women in leadership positions making decisions list taking into account what women need um, because we're not seeing that right now point also on the double burden of care which means that women have been under extra stress and also global vaccine inequity that means that the women health workers that need PPE most are also the most um, likely not to be vaccinated yet. So bringing this all together what the impact has been it's been suffering it's been women fainting because they've overheated they've had UTIs they haven't been able to go to the toilet as often as they need so dehydration really common um, in all health systems and um, reuse feeling women feeling unsafe and there's lots 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 more of this in the report and then yeah where, where is this all coming to ultimately is a catastrophe as women health workers leaving this profession when we need them most we need pp we pp matters and we cannot afford to lose one more health worker leave you with uh, some recommendations that we'll be continuing to advocate around um of course addressing gender equity occup strengthening occupational health meeting commitments governance and, and the issue of design as well that um caroline's talked about so and there's just to leave you with a few uh words uh, recommendations from women health workers themselves all this is in the report um thank you very much over to you femi thanks so much rachel rachel is going to be available for q a a little bit later on so if you have questions you want to get deeper into that research you want to know more about the stats rachel is here for us for you Prosi Moyingo is a community health worker in Uganda with one of the best internet connections I've ever seen coming from Uganda. It was meant to happen live. Prosi, nice to see you. Will you help us out by giving us a testimonial? We're talking about PPE and women's use of PPE in health care and care workers and the problems associated with that. What would you like to share with us from your experience in Uganda and your work. Mm, thanks, Femi. Um, I'm a community health worker supported by Living Goods in Uganda. For the past two years, it has been critical for us to continue delivering health services to our neighbors. Mm -hmm. But as we have been doing that, we added on talking about COVID-19, helping them to understand, to, we, we handle myths about COVID-19 and the misconception in the community. The good thing they trust us to give them the right information about health. But, but access to PPE, 
has been a difficult. Though we get some PPEs from living goods where I work from, they give us masks, gloves, and portable sanitizers monthly, but it is not enough due to our work we do. It's critical in my work because it protects me from acquiring infect to infect to to infection from the patients we work on. And at the same time, it pre prevents us from spreading infectious to others. So as a community health worker, during this pandemic, I joined my fellow CHWs to advocate for our rights and benefits we need to do our work. So the PPEs we are getting, they are not enough. Uh, we call upon those in policymakers, political leaders, plus the government to include community health workers in the PPE procedurement calculations. We need it to be counted along other community health workers in the health system. This pandemic has shown us how the community need us. So we need to be protected to protect others. Don't forget in the community health workers, 70% we are women. The good thing when you, you, you protect women, you will be protecting the whole nation. Thank you. Thank you, Prosy, for your testimonial. So we go from a community health worker in Uganda, Prosy, to an ER nurse in Bolivia, Ola Florentina. So if we unmute the person who is playing this, so unmute yourself, then we'll be able to hear your video. Hola, soy Florentina, enfermera de quirófanos del Hospital Obrero en la ciudad de Santa Cruz de la Sierra, Bolivia. Respecto a las dificultades que experimentamos como personal de salud en relación al acceso a los equipos de protección personal, ha sido principalmente la falta de, de estos productos que la institución inicialmente no nos proveía. Y, por otro lado, se tuvo que eh, reutilizar productos que eran de un solo uso. Además que en un determinado momento eh, el stock que la institución tenía pues se acabó y no había en el mercado para reabastecerse. Por lo tanto, cada una de nosotras tuvo que tomar la decisión de buscar a través de sus propios medios eh, en el, productos en el mercado que no necesariamente cumplían con las normas o con la calidad que la Organización Mundial de la Salud exigía. Sin embargo, la necesidad de protegernos era tan imperiosa que tuvimos que recurrir a productos e insumos que, que eran de mala calidad. Por otra parte, eh, me gustaría decirles a las autoridades que están ocupando cargos eh, de decisión a nivel del gobierno y de las instituciones pues, que se destinen más recursos para la salud, Y además que en estos cargos pues se pongan a personal eh, que realmente que sea competente, que tengan conocimiento de la situación y por lo tanto puedan tomar mejores decisiones. Por otro lado, decirles a las autoridades nacionales, a las autoridades de gobierno que cuiden al personal de salud. Si el personal de salud se enferma, no va a poder brindar una atención de calidad a la población. Thank you to Florentina for that contribution to our discussion. I'm going to bring in our panel and they're going to introduce themselves to you. I'm going to greet them very warmly and informally and they will formally introduce themselves. So I will say hello to Natasha, uh, Stephanie, Sumya, Tokshi and Alice and then they are going to share their amazing titles and their um, backgrounds as well, so that you know who they are, where they're coming from in our panel discussion. Natasha, so nice to have you. Please introduce yourself to our global audience. 
Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I just want to thank um, Women in Global Health and J&J &J and all of my fellow panelists and Euphemi for putting this um, really timely and important panel together. Um, it is uh, really quite an honor to be with folks today. And, um, you know, I've been in global health for a long time, but my latest um, iteration um, is as the Deputy Assistant Administrator at the United States Agency for International Development in the Bureau for Global Health. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that we all have um, quite a large um, and impressive set of resumes, but what I'll just say to introduce myself is, you know, global health has really been um, my career. Um, I have really focused all of my attention in my adult life on this issue. And um, I have been lucky enough to have worked and participated and worked with um, some really incredible people in this um, area. But really um, what I wanna say is some incredible women. And, um, and what's so great for me to be here is given how much women are impacted and impact progress in global health. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, it, is, it is something that um, I'm really glad we're able to focus on here. Oh. It has been an interest for me for many, many years. And, um, and I'm just really thrilled to be with everyone today. Good to have you, Natasha. I'm gonna say hello to your co-panelists. Hello, Stephanie, so great to have you. Please wow our audience with your official title um, and what you do. Thanks. Um, it's great to be here. Stephanie Williams is my name. I'm Australia's Ambassador for Regional Health Security and in that role have been guiding our government's international health assistance response to COVID, including vaccine access. Um, and I work as a Principal Health Advisor for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to have a broader view of health beyond health security. So the perspective I bring is both as a wearer of PPE, a procurer of PPE, and someone who's been working with PPE in our response to date. I'll stop there. Thanks, Stephanie. Dr. Sumia, welcome to this discussion. If you need an introduction, I'm gonna get you to do it yourself. Uh, over the last uh, 18 months or so, I'm sure people would have seen your work, but please remind them who you are, what you do. Thank you, Femi, and uh, greetings to the fellow panelists. And it was wonderful to hear from the healthcare workers that we've just heard from. And congratulations to uh, Women in Global Health uh, and the uh, J&J for having put this very important topic together. So I'm a pediatrician by training. I'm from India. I've worked all my life on diseases like tuberculosis and HIV, really working with underserved communities and populations. And uh, most, a lot of what I've learned, I've learned from members of the healthcare work group in our uh, research uh, institutes, mostly nurses, social workers, community health workers. And, um, and everything that's being said today is really resonating with me. And of course, we've also talked about the, the sort of uh, disproportionate representation of women in decision-making levels. And I think we'll get into what we can do when we get into the panel to change things. Oh, yeah. That's really critical. Dr. Tochi, welcome. So lovely to have you. Please introduce yourself to our webinar audience today. Thank you, Femi, and good afternoon, everybody. And I would like to thank um, the organizers of this program. My name is Tochi Opo, and I lead the antimicrobial resistance and infection prevention and control work at the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And in that capacity, I chair Nigeria's Antimicrobial Resistance Coordination Committee. And since 2014, following the Ebola outbreak in Nigeria, and fast forward 2020, we have the COVID pandemic, the last fever outbreaks we've been having in country every year. It's been my job to mitigate the negative impact of all these things in the Nigerian health facilities and work hard to support health workers to remain protected. So personal protective equipment considerations have been a critical part of the work I've done in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. If I bring the perspective of somebody who works in a resource constrained settings and would have to make provisions and allowances and decisions on who gets personal protective equipment, do you do strategic stockpiling or for routine care? And then add on to that other issues around gender inequity, issues around climate, issues around working conditions. 
So I hope to bring all those perspectives to the discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I hope so too. We have an ambitious, ambitious agenda. Alice, so lovely to have you. Please introduce yourself to our webinar audience. Thank you, Femi, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. It's uh, an honor to join this panel today, and thank you to Women of Global Health for putting out an important report and, and gathering this group together. I'm uh, very honored to be amongst a number of amazing women around the world on the front lines of care. Uh, maybe what I'll share as a perspective is I, I come from a um, immigrant family uh, humble roots in China and very much have personally been impacted uh, through whether it be lack of health care or whether it be around the power of access to care and education to really change patients, change families and change lives. And very much now uh, based here in the US, very much looking to see how we can bring point of care through healthcare workers around the world. Uh, I work at Johnson & Johnson and look after our social innovation and impact investing efforts. And largely what I would say about today is I uh, wanted to thank Prasi and Florentine for bringing the voices of the front line. Uh, healthcare workers count, uh, community health workers count, and very much are delivering care uh, very much where uh, others can't reach right now. Uh, so, so thank you for everything you do today. And what I'd like to do maybe is present a little bit around curiosity around how we can move from some of the amazing data uh, that has been elevated here today, as well as the stories and needs from the front line and how we can collectively move towards solutions to not have women continue to stay at the sidelines, but to be fully embedded in all the processes and solutions in which we wanna create within the future. Thank you, Femi. Oh, you're so welcome. Right, panel, we have so much to do and a limited amount of time to do it. Natasha is already writing notes. Natasha, what did you just write down? Share it with us. Let's start being interactive. Um, so what I just wrote down was actually um, how we can come out of um, this discussion in the next 30 minutes with some real um, action items on exactly what Alice just said is how do we take the data that Women in Global Health and J&J &J has presented hearing the stories, hearing the actual experiences, and what can we all do in our different positions to move this ball forward? So that's what I wrote down. <laughs> Did you have an answer to that how? Because that's critical. Yeah, and look, I think we all have very different roles to play in all of this. And I think that's, um, you know, when I think about my role at USAID, and, and obviously, you know, I've been enmeshed in the COVID um, work at the agency for the year that I've been here. And, you know, there are so many issues, but I think what continues to come up over and over again in a lot of different ways is, is healthcare workers. I mean, I think they are really the point of entry to really get um, different, um, whether it's a vaccine, whether it's um, other types of um, important activities to people. And so, you know, as a donor, I think we are really thinking about how do we ensure that um, the countries in need get the um, materials that they need and supplies that they need to do this work. Um, but I think it's a it's a fair, a very important point is how do we actually ensure that the end user of these things are actually able to use them in the way that they are used. All right, so you've got questions, and hopefully through our panel, we will have answers. Stephanie, you were also writing, share your notepad with us. Oh, I was just thinking about um, the value of multiple perspectives, as Natasha has said, in articulating what needs to change, but where the power of those perspectives is most important if we're talking about shifting the ways in which this particular commodity, PPE, is conceived, manufactured and ordered. And I think from an emergency response perspective through an aid program and through a, a, a global COVID response, we were a temporary and not a normal procurer of PPE. Um, and and I think we will return to a not normal procurer of PPE if I think pragmatically in five years time. And then I thought, well, who is who has the power as a healthcare worker to start demanding better fit? And I thought about female surgeons, to be frank. When you look at what surgeons can demand in their operating theater, 
um, a particular instrument, a particular type of dressing, a particular, there is a lot that goes around supporting choices of some of the more powerful voices in the healthcare sector, mm -hmm. potentially starting with a high net worth demand person for PPE is one thing I had just jotted down. It was an early thought. Mm. Toshi, uh, when Stephanie was talking about the fit and the design of equipment, I know you have something very detailed to add, like surgeon's gloves, for instance. Tell us more. Okay. When Stephanie was talking, I just, my mind just went back to a visit I had in um, one of the Lassa Fever Treatment Centers in Nigeria a couple of years ago. And I was just imagining this female health worker putting on a full body PPE that was obviously too long for her, but because of her other parts of her body that couldn't be accommodated by the male design PPE, she now had to look a bigger size that would accommodate her hips and her, her bust area. It was now too long and she was tripping she was working in a Lassa fever treatment um, center. And I wondered if somebody had bothered to take her perspective into consideration, even something as simple as the excess material that was put into the lens could be repurposed and redistributed in a full body PPE. So I make the strong case for including the ideas and the perspectives of women female in the design of um, these um, personal protective equipment. Dr. Sonia, Dr. Tochi just said something that was so obvious. It's so like, duh, of course it has to fit women who are working in healthcare, working in medicine, um, all the way through from the people who look after the instruments, make sure the surgery is clean to the person who is doing the procedures, etc. Why? Are we having this conversation in 2022? Yes, indeed, uh, Femi, it's rather unfortunate that it's taken a pandemic, I think, to highlight this issue, but maybe it's better late than never. As you know, WHO you know, is a normative body. We do make recommendations, guidelines, and set standards. I think Dr. Adriana Velasquez, who heads our medical devices standards uh, work, has joined and is listening today, we, we are very committed to getting some type of global consensus on specifications for PPE, which take into account the needs uh, of women, but also take into account things like climatic differences. What is comfortable in a colder climate can be extremely uncomfortable, in fact, unbearable in a hot climate and you know I've, I'm used to working in a very hot tropical environment and I wouldn't be able to bear the idea of getting into a full PPE if I'm a community health worker there so I wouldn't be complying with with what we um, so we want to set standards we need we want to would like to work with all of the groups that have been brought together here basically on getting that feedback the user views because that is what is, uh, is critical, as I said, on just not on the gender issue, but also on affordability, on reuse, on cost, on simplicity, and on comfort, all of these things. And at the same time, the PPE has to obviously protect the person from, um, from infectious disease hazards. So we need more research. We need like the survey that was presented. We need the innovators to work hand in hand, but the power that WHO has is to, to be able to set the standards, to be able to describe the technical specifications and to provide a mechanism for developers, innovators to get their products pre-qualified. So we've just launched a call for pre-qualification of masks. And this of course in, increases people's global acceptability and, the way, and if they're able to um, sell, sell their products worldwide. So the stamp of WHO is extremely important, but I think we have a ways to go we did important work during the Ebola outbreak. I think that was very useful, but now I think we really need to focus on these uh, issues. The UN um, uh, Economic Commission for Europe, I think did come up with some standards. Of course, it's, it's one regional body, but they've uh, developed uh, something called uh, Gender Responsive Standards Declaration. And many uh, bodies have signed up 
to that. So we need something like that at the global level, where there are gender responsive standards and manufacturers, as well as procurement agencies, regulators, all of them need to align to that. So Dr. Samir, at the moment, from what I understand, the WHO's guidance on PPE is gender blind. Yeah, unfortunate, I mean, uh, term to use, but uh, we have not, I think, really looked into this, uh, into this issue, even though many other, um, you know, needs have been looked into as far as PPE is concerned. But this is why I'm saying that it will be important for our teams to work with and to, be, to get the support of people on this call and other groups that have looked into this in great detail that have very concrete ideas. And perhaps we should set up a stakeholder group to take this uh, work forward. Yeah, absolutely. very committed to doing that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When, when Natasha's saying, let's do some action, what will be the action that comes out of this? I think if the, if the WHO, who is our global guidance in terms of best practices, does not have a gender specific view on PPE, that has got to be the takeaway. Mm -hmm. um, Alice, thank you for your patience. Uh, Natasha was wanted some, some concrete action to come out of this. And I'm wondering whether um, if you look at corporations, and you look at private, the private sector, do you feel that that is an area where there can be some concrete action, or at least some resources, support, leadership? Your thoughts from your J&J &J perspective? Oh, absolutely. I, I feel that no one actor can really uh, make the change that's needed at the level and the size and scale at the speed. And so uh, partnerships are incredibly important. Uh, Dr. Sumia's view around standards and the role that WHO can play within that neutral body is incredibly important. Healthcare workers and civil society to reach where perhaps governments cannot uh, is incredibly important. Um, and hopefully corporations as well can play, play a role. I thought about uh, just two things, just reflecting on the conversation today, uh, again, from a curiosity of how, how we can move the needle both in the long term, but also in the short term within our own seats. Uh, the one thing is around, I would say, collective voice and making sure the right voices are at the table. I think all of us individually from our uh, organizational seats uh, have a platform that can be used. I think raising that platform collectively in a very single uh, minded way around the desire and the need for uh, women to be at the table, healthcare workers to be at the table um, is really, really important and lending our platforms for those voices is, is great. I was thinking about the question of why this has taken so long, why a pandemic needed to happen. You know, and 25% right now of health workforce leadership positions are women. That's That's just not enough given that 70% of women are representing the health workforce. And as women are looking to uh, really make these changes, uh, we, we need to be in the front seat of those. And we need to have the voice at the leadership level, not just on the ground. Uh, so, so one is how do we move the needle on leadership roles, uh, particularly if amongst healthcare workers, so that advocacy can happen from a lived experience. Uh, the second piece I was thinking about is just an internal reflection uh, around human-centered design and the design process. And one of the things that we've been thinking about is, you know, how do you prompt the question? You know, when you're designing a new package, a new consumer product, uh, you know, you have a number of questions and screens in the beginning, whether it be around the safety of something, whether it be around um, the health outcomes, the efficacy. And one of our human-centered design uh, uh, scientists came up and said, well, why don't you prompt a question that says, has, uh, have women uh, uh, tested this product? Uh, you know, have you thought about the gender lens within here? And, uh, you know, sometimes I think just the prompt of the question within the design early on within the screens will really help then, uh, you know, kind of have people pause and think about, hey, you know, we, we actually didn't uh, think enough about the women and gender lens. We, we hadn't thought about the climate pieces and the culturally competent areas. Uh, so, so I almost wonder if even a prompt within the designing of products and PP&E very early on, rather at the end stated distribution, could be a way to also get at this challenge. Mm. Stephanie, what are you thinking? Um, I'm just thinking that there is no incentive for the PPE industry. If you have a look at who's making and distributing PPE over the last two years, 
and is being good for business, right? When we first looked to buy surgical gowns, we got a quote for our stockpiles and, you know, very early on, they were 50 cents. The next day they were $11. The, this report is really important and timely and I, I agree with the comments about the perspectives and putting um, the perspectives from healthcare workers in particular in design. But I'm also thinking about the dynamics of the industry that we have as at today. They have a uh, free pass is two is is you know is one way to describe it. They've got a captive market. So when we think about what we do in global health to address market failure, there are vehicles that we have invested in, in the past to in address market failure for new drugs for malaria for TB product development partnerships where. Uh, donors, industry, private sector, people come together to say, these products need to improve. It's hard to get a demand for them yet because the purchasing power and interest just isn't there. But can we address at least the innovation side of a market failure and create these products, then create a market for it and access? And, and do we have a role in supporting that process to innovate in this part of the health technology arena? Either? I want to wrap in some of the comments and questions that are coming along the side of our webinar. Thank you. Some really interesting stuff going on here. For instance, this one is for Rachel. So Rachel, um, make yourself available to us, but it, it's really a good question for all the panel. How can we raise support and increase women health leadership roles, especially in a COVID context? Dr. Toshi, do you want to start? Just briefly, a thought. You're already a health leader, but how do we get more like you? Thank you for that question. Um, as I read the report and um, realized that 25% senior roles, women make up just 25% of senior um, leadership in a sector where there are 70% of the workforce. And in the context of COVID-19, 90% of the front-facing um, health workers are women. And I asked myself the question, how do you go from 70% to 25%? So I decided to just check up in my own country's chief medical director of the Epeshari hospitals in Nigeria. And I realized that currently 57 are males and one is a female. So how do you discuss somebody who is not at the table? I think there has to be data driving some of these decisions on who gets leadership role. What is stopping women from progressing? How do you start out with men at the same level and then get smaller at the top? Mm -hmm. What are the things limiting women? What are the biases? What are those challenges that women are facing that doesn't allow them to have their voice at the table? Because when women are on the table, as you discuss gender-related issues, then they can relate a bit um, better. So I make the case that there be a structured and deliberate approach and an attempt to empower women in leadership positions, particularly in our own side of the world, where they have to overcome barriers that are also cultural, added to other um, challenges that their colleagues in other parts of the world will have to um, contend with. Rachel, that question was originally for you, but it's really relevant for everybody. But having seen that survey, putting the report together, did, did you have a light bulb moment about how do we fix this? Because we have a gender imbalance in so many ways. It's not rocket science, but it really is about involving women and listening to women. And like tochi has been saying, other panelists have been, panelists have been saying, giving women the seat at the table, but then that also shouldn't be uh, an action to, to give women, it should be women actually sitting themselves at the table and being empowered to be in those decision-making rooms and being able to contribute, whether that's in terms of setting standards. And um, we know um, the, the work that Dr. Sumya mentioned in uh, WHO in the Europe region, they are, they are starting to address this, but it's a little bit and it's, it's a little, it's, a, it's too, too little too late as usual, but there is the opportunity. And I think it is, yeah, it's bringing women in 
um, and listening and respecting them because what we did, some stressing things we heard in the, the research was women actually being silenced when they speak out a, about their concerns around PPE. And then that has a kind of a knock, knock on effect. And what we need is we need women to be supported. Um, and there are ways to do that kind of formally in, in with, with unions and collective bargaining and things. But we also, we need, we need men <laughs> and we need everyone to be on board with this. It's mm -hmm. not just about, um, yeah, it's not just about women being given power yeah. it's about um men stepping aside and welcoming us to the yes. to the tables those 57 men that that dr tochi told us about 25 of them need to say um actually i have a female colleague and she is much as good as i am and i feel that gender balance is important here take this position uh dr tochi in nigeria that's not going to happen is it who knows Anything is possible. Now, at least at the NCDC, the, um, the ratio is actually, we have a lot of women in leadership roles in my own organization. And um, with advocacy and strong voices stepping out like this, um, I, I, I have hope. I really, really do have hope. And um, the future belongs to women. We just have to push for it. Natasha, I'm just wondering from the USA perspective, lessons learned so far from COVID. COVID pandemic has taught us so much. So if we, we already knew there was this gender imbalance in terms of health care leadership, but the idea of the protective clothing that you're actually wearing is not fit for women. What have you learned? So I guess a couple of things. I think the first um, thing to realize is that we are working directly with countries. And so just I wanted to kind of respond to one of the questions in the chat about, you know, how we are doing this work. So, you know, we purchase high quality items um, that are in the international standards. And, um, and we work with the countries. So if countries want N95s, we are supplying those things. I think to answer your question specifically about what we've learned. I mean, I think you're right. I think it, it has been, um, I think Sumia said it, that, you know, it, it's, it's a tough nut to hmm. swallow um, that it's taken something like this to, you know, really kind of bring all of these conversations to bear. And I want to reiterate what I said in the beginning, that I think everybody has a role in this. And when I think about what some of those solutions are, I do, I want to reiterate the many times people have said that, you know, the end users of these, um, uh, of these interventions, um, ne their voice needs to be heard. And I think as we on the global level are thinking about these and thinking about different targets for PPE, but all sorts of other interventions and supplies, you know, how do these issues get woven into um, these Natasha, larger... If, if, I, so, if I may, I have, a, I have a very specific question for you because we, we, we're going back to where you started with the how, which is really poking us to think about, we've got to problem mm -hmm. solve here. David Burden has, a, has quite a direct question for you at USAID mm -hmm. about the kind of PPE that is bought and is it bought in a number of different sizes so that you are already thinking about women working in PPE, did that occur to you? Dr. Sumia was very honest, it didn't to the WHO. How about USA, AID? So I think what, so I would say we're in a similar boat. I, what I would also say is that, you know, I think that this is where, um, you know, we're working in a hundred countries and we are taking the lead from countries. So again, I think it's this sort of both both ended piece where there needs to be advocacy from the country on this side, but there also needs to be support from the global side to make sure. And that's also where I think, again, as we're thinking about targets, et cetera, how do we ensure, or we maybe to not frame it as a question, yes. we need to all ensure. Yeah, let's not, yeah, I, I agree. These with you. issues are incorporated into the discussions that we are having and having targets around them, if that makes I mean, sense. I have to say, this is deeply shocking that we're even having this conversation at this point. Stephanie, what were you going to say? You're frowning, articulate the frown. No, I, um, so we had good advice from WHO in the Pacific region about multi-size PPE procurement from extra small to extra, extra, extra large. We have a very diverse population. 
And we did on advice from WHO and with partners from, you know, 22 January 2020, procure a range of sizes for fit. And during the last 18 months, have adjusted those orders and deliveries when countries have said, no, we need more extra, extra large or we need more small or we need some more small gloves. So I, I don't think it's been a complete failure on the size point. Actually, mm. there's been good advice, good feedback and accommodation, um, but that absolutely does not take away from the very relevant findings of the report that we are talking about today on fit and demand. I really like, panel, what Deborah Wilcox shared with the audience. And Deborah said, should we be looking top down or bottom up? We can design masks, and we made several different versions during the early pandemic, but N95 filters were impossible to get. Let's not wait. Yes, we can do it. That is a really good point for me to ask you. And this is quite hard, panel. A sentence to wrap up our panel discussion that will provoke support, inspire our audience to go out and act so that we can come back in a year, maybe less than a year, and know that this conversation has made a difference. Alice, what do you want to share with us? At, at two things. One is be the change agent from where you are to make this a reality. Mm -hmm. And the second is if we care for our healthcare workers, she will care for all of us. Mm. Dr. Sumya. I think we have some opportunities now because of the pandemic and because the topic, this topic and others have come to the fore and countries, in fact, as we speak, the executive board is going on. They're looking at the, um, the review of the international health regulations and we have opportunities to add topics like this. So when a country is reporting back on their compliance with international health regulations with infection prevention and control, one of the things questions asked could be, have you taken into consideration the needs of women health workers? Uh, and not just, as I said, it's not just the issue of the sex and the differences in the body, but also the context of the country, the climate, the affordability, the materials that are used, the eco-friendliness. You know, we, we are uh, using a lot more plastic during the pandemic than we did before. It's not good for the environment. So I think we need to think about, about all of those. And then finally, I would say that we, we want to promote innovation. And I think there's, you know, there's just exciting amount of innovation happening around the world, particularly you mentioned the bottom up. I think we have to look at innovations in countries done by people who are actually experiencing these things on the ground. And, the WHO has a compendium of uh, innovations uh, around medical devices where we will add the PEs and the masks and, and hopefully encourage more uh, innovations. But again, then it has to be linked with regulators and procurers because okay. if uh, there's no market, um, then that product is going to die, die out. All right, Pano, I have to do this swiftly because we're almost at the end of our session. Natasha. So my sentence um, would really be that we have to all use our voices and all of our different positions and platforms to move toward um, you know, what we are all agreeing upon is a critical goal. Thank you, Stephanie. Oh, just to focus on the levers available to you um, whilst knowing the levers available to others. And I was thinking from government perspective about enabling innovation and then uh, d regulations through procurement methods, um, which can drive demand in a different way. Um, Thank you so much. And, and uh, Dr. Tochi. Thank you. Um, just a point to make here, and that is that when shortages occur and there's a scramble, hierarchy comes into effect. And often women are at the bottom of that hierarchy. So from a government perspective, I recommend that procurement, innovation, development of personal protective equipment be based on need so that the vulnerable parts of the society who incidentally are the ones doing most of the work in healthcare don't suffer needlessly. Thank you. Thank you so much, panel. What a great group effort and 
audience as well, webinar audience, you are problem solving, you are putting solutions, you are putting challenges to each other. Use that comment section to connect as well. I feel with that connection that there will maybe action as well. So I appreciate how active you have been. All right, so we're not over yet. The two more important people you need to hear from, Kaya Lewis Atkins is from the Global Fund. I Over to you, Kaya. Hello, everyone, and thank you uh, so much for having me. And, and Femi, I'll, I'll go quick. I know we're, sh we're, sh we're short on, <laughs> we, short we on have time. We have time for you. I was just hurrying up. Well, that's <laughs> so all. we have time for you. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, though, um, it's been amazing to hear what everyone has had to say and the themes of what our panelists have said about, um, you know, Prosy about uh, not having enough, but needing to advocate. And I would just get right to the point, which is the, the theme that I've seen across everyone is about partnership. And uh, the Global Fund is a partnership and uh, of countries and communities and foundations and businesses. And we, we work on that model. And so, you know, the Global Fund uh, gave out over $500 million in investments on PPE in 2021. Uh, and we also did a COVID response mechanism in 2020. And we found in that process that we didn't have enough feedback from our communities and from people on the ground. And so in 2021, we did a lot. We went through a lot of processes to involve community, women and girls on the ground, other communities affected and healthcare workers. And so the feedback from community and what we're doing is of the ultimate importance. And so I think that what we need to do moving forward is not forget that. And at every point in the process, in the development process, so that we're, we're not always talking about reference man <laughs> to the d distribution, to the sizes, get feedback from women at all points. And it, that is what can help us make a difference at this, at this point uh, in the epidemic. We in at the Global Fund, and I, I bring you greetings on behalf of Peter Sands, our executive director, uh, cherish the community voices that we have. And my, my colleagues in the community rights and gender piece of the Global Fund, see, I told you, Femi, I was timing myself. Um, <laughs> we, That'd be we impressive. Put a lot of, <laughs> we actually put, um, we had specific consultations in several, many countries actually, just for women and girls on our COVID uh, response mechanism on what they needed. And what we've been hearing is, is, this, is the same thing that, you know, to outreach and continue the HIV, TB and malaria responses we had, we needed to make sure that all of our uh, community voices on the ground felt safe and felt comfortable. And so we need to continue to invest in making sure that we have community voices at the table. And um, we know that women uh, lead the way and are the healthcare decision makers and way makers in our communities. And so having women involved at all points is, is crucial. Hiya, thank you so much. We really appreciate your help with wrapping up our discussion today. I'm just looking at the comments section. Thank you, Kaya, really appreciate you. It says here, brilliant discussion. Thank you. Thank you for bringing women together to raise awareness, actively engaging communities and to finding solutions for big and small matters. I cannot see her yet, but any moment now I will see Rupert Dutt, the Executive Director of Women in Global Health. I am sure Rupa is smiling at the comments section as you're all piling in, telling us how it went for you. Thank you so much for being part of the discussion of attendees. I really appreciate you. Rupa, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Femi, and thank you to all of our excellent speakers and to j, j Foundation, our sponsor, but I am so excited to see how we've already in these uh, last 60 minutes moved the conversation forward from the reference man to really, I'd say, the reference woman and how do we really make sure that particularly global health and the health that we're delivering is designed and supporting women health workers. The results of the Women in Global Health survey on PPE are truly shocking. Women health and care workers have put their lives at risk and they continue to do so 
often without the PPE, that they need to protect their health. As we've heard, if we protect our community health workers, if we protect our women, they can then protect uh, their people and their nation. And they're expected to work very long shifts uh, in conditions um, that we cannot imagine, conditions that might be uh, very hot and tropical. Uh, um, well, in, uh, other uh, conditions where they don't have access to uh, the appropriate uh, feminine hygiene that they need. And so PPE is too often uncomfortable, undignified, and simply just not fit for women. Uh, this is something we all must acknowledge as a fact and start working to change together collectively. Um, as we've heard, partnership has been a key theme that has uh, emerged in today's conversation. We at Women in Global Health will be following up on this report with an innovation design challenge inviting women-led organizations to propose PPE designs that are fit for women. We hope we can count on all of uh, the organizations and all of you. Um, really delighted to hear that the World Health Organization is embarking on an area of work on this, uh, but there are many others that are not in today's conversation that we must bring into the conversation to ensure that PPE can, is designed for everyone in all genders. We will work with our Women in Global chapters, which are present in 40 different uh, countries around the world to improve access locally. There was a key point about demand must be created by um, countries at the national level. And as the WHO executive board meeting is convening, it's a reminder that we must have country driven solutions and country driven uh, demands when it comes to addressing this pandemic and being prepared for future pandemics. Without adequate PPE, the right to a decent, healthy and safe working environment is being violated. It's exposing many health workers to ill health health and causing others to become demoralized and leave the sector. We're hearing about the great resignation. After two years of a global pandemic, levels of burnout amongst health workers are alarming with estimates that one in five, I'm going to say that again, one in workers, particularly women nurses and midwives are planning to leave their jobs if they haven't done so already. And this is against a backdrop of a serious global health worker shortage. And as million health workers were needed by 2030 to achieve our sustainable development goal on health, but we know that they're leaving at high numbers. This risk is an unmanaged migration for health workers to go to high income countries, which will further undermine health systems in low and middle income countries. So again, this pandemic is an opportunity to rebuild global health. We've heard that uh, loud and clear in today's conversation for a stronger foundation by ensuring that women who largely deliver health systems have safe, decent, and equal work that requires both vaccine FBE and as we've heard, they also need to be included in leadership roles. And bringing women into leadership roles means that we must not focus on fixing women, but fixing systems and creating enabling environments. And part of that enabling environment is making sure that women get the support and protection they need with PPE. The failure to protect women healthcare workers is a moral failure. It is a failure of accountability by both governments and employers. Ultimately, a failure to protect women healthcare workers is a failure to protect ourselves. We cannot do business and gender inequality as usual as we emerge from this pandemic. Women health and care workers need a new social contract based on equality, safety, dignity, and that will be the foundation for stronger health systems and global health security. Again, thank you to everyone for tuning in today, to our panelists, to our partners, uh, and Femi for just bringing this conversation, moving us forward. Oh, you're, you're so very welcome. This webinar was brought to you by Women in Global Health and JNJ. &J. If you would like to share it with your colleagues, anybody else who you feel needs to know about PPE being fit for women, go to Women in Global Health's website, look for the Fit for Women webpage, and there you will find this recording. And there you will say, you will, you will find me saying, thank you so much for being part of this webinar. It couldn't happen without you. Take care, everybody. <laughs>